Okay, so thank you everybody. I'd like to thank our, uh, the host for inviting me. I'm gonna be talking about something a little bit different than the prior two speakers and step back and talk about it, the uh, factors that are associated with CLL risk from a, uh, a population standpoint. And so I don't have any conflicts or disclosures. So I have three objectives of my talk. The first is to know what epidemiological factors affect one's risk of getting CLL. The second is to understand that inherited genetic uh, variants are, have a strong uh, role in CLL risk. And then the third one is what are the clinical implications of these factors. So what are the known factors for CLL risk? I know a, non a number of you know some of these but may not even think about it. So the first one is age. Here's a plot of the distribution of CLL incidence across uh, age. Uh, and you can see that for uh, individuals who are ages 65 to 74, 74 years of old, they have the highest incidence of CLL, where the, it's almost non-existent for CLL risk in those individuals who are under the age of 20. Uh, the median age of onset for CLL is 71 years of age based on the SEER registry. So another risk factor is sex. Um, so I, I know you all know that uh, CLL has a higher incidence in males than in females. And this is true across all races. The underlying biology of this is still unknown. Race is another risk factor for CLL. Uh, here I show that Caucasians um, have a higher incidence race rates compared to Asians. This is both true for males and females. Again, it's unknown why there's this uh, variability in incidence in CLO. So what are the non-demographic factors that are associated with CLO? Obviously age, sex, race, these are things you can't modify. You're stuck with them. Um, but there's a number of studies that have been done to try to look at some of the other potentially modifiable factors. And so most of, a number of these studies have been conducted in the Interlymph Consortium. This is a consortium of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma case control studies, uh, and it was initiated in 2001 with the overall goal of pooling studies across uh, a whole bunch of uh, study centers in order to increase your sample size and, and get a better precision and power to uh, evaluate associations of these risk factors and, and CLL and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma overall. And you can see by the stars where uh, the contributing, con contributing centers are. Oops. Um, uh, we have most of the studies in North America. We have a number of studies in Europe. And I don't want to forget my colleagues out in Australia there, too. So one of the larger studies that we've done in Interlymph uh, was published in 2014, where we evaluated a number of risk factors in 2,400 CLL cases and 1,500 controls. We looked at lifestyle exposures. Um, alcohol, smoking, BMI. We also had reproductive history exposures that we assessed. We included medical exposures, autoimmune conditions, hepatitis C virus, atopy, blood transfusions. We had a, a whole slew of occupational folk, uh, exposures that we assessed, and then family history. So I'm going to give you a 30,000 foot view of our results right at the moment. So the, thing, the items in green are the, so, are the factors that have a, a protective effect with risk of CLL. But the items in red are showing increased risk of CLL. And so let's do a little deeper dive. So my colleague out in New South Wales, uh, Ann Cricker, she looked at total sun exposure and the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And here you can see uh, the contributing interlymph studies that provided, CLL, that provided cases and controls. And this, again, is non-Hodgkin's lymphoma overall. And what you see is a nice pattern across the studies showing an inverse association with sun exposure and, and NHL risk. And so they also showed, again, here's for recreational sun exposure. And this is self-reported inf uh, information by the, the study participants. So here are the studies, again, contributing the data. And you, uh, again, you see a nice consistent pattern across the studies showing an inverse association with the overall effect size of 0.76. And because this talk is about uh, CLL, the paper also goes into uh, uh, lymphoma-specific subtypes. So here's CLL, SLL. Again, with an increased uh, sun exposure, you have a decreased uh, 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 association with risk of CLL. So we updated these results in 2014, again, looking at total sun exposure and recreational exposure. 
uh, for risk of CLL, and we still see this uh, inverse association of either 25 to 20 to 25 percent uh, reduction in risk. Now, obviously, the underlying hypothesis driving this association is, is vitamin D. However, vitamin D, uh, uh, has been, uh, vitamin D has been shown to be an antiproliferative uh, uh, factor, and it also uh, provides pro-cell uh, uh, cell differentiation. Vi vitamin D is uh, difficult to measure in uh, observational studies. Um, in part, if you look at the, uh, um, the uh, derivatives of vitamin D in the blood, uh, they vary based on the timing of the blood draw. Um, so in the summer, if you have a blood draw, the vitamin D levels in your blood is much higher than what you find in the winter. Uh, um, obesity is another risk factor or a confounder for vitamin D measured in the blood. And so really what we need is a nice clinical trial to, to help uh, evaluate this association of vitamin D and risk of, of, of CLL. And so that's what this trial has done. It started in 2012. It's, it's called a VITAL trial. It's a random, randomized placebo-controlled trial where they are, are, uh, have 20,000 individuals enrolled in the trial. The endpoint is, is uh, cancer. The individuals are given uh, 2,000 uh, IUs of C uh, vitamin D on a daily basis for five years, and they're trying, trying to see, obviously, those who are randomized to receive vitamin D supplementation, do they have a protective effect against cancer overall compared to those who don't have the ran uh, who are not randomized to receive vitamin D. And so, the, like I said, the endpoint is cancer overall, but then they will go into the cancer-specific sites. So the next factors that we looked at is, is some medical factors, and so I'll, I'll go into atopy. And when I talk about atopy, I'm talking about allergies, eczema, asthma, and hay fever. So again, my colleagues out in New South Wales looked at uh, any allergy and the risk of NHL overall. And here you again, you have the contributing studies. Here's the effect or the association of, of any allergies and risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And you can see a clear, uh, when you do com combine all these studies, you see a clear 20% reduction in risk of, of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Um, if you go down to the lymphoma subtypes, here's it's shown in the rows here. For any allergies, it's about a 16% reduction in risk. Uh, you also see reduction for asthma, hay fever, and eczema. So we updated these data uh, with the 2014 paper where, uh, again, we looked at these uh, particular allergies and risk of chronic lymphocytic leukemia in this particular study. And here we still see a reduction, a significant reduction of risk uh, for any allergies uh, as well as hay fever. Uh, the eczema and the asthma, however, kind of uh, attenuated to a null result. Obviously, the underlying biology for atopia or allergies in particular is a hyperimmune system. So if you have a hyperimmune system, then we hypothesize that you have a, a better protection against cancer. So the other, uh, another medical exposure that we looked at is hepatitis C virus. So my colleague, uh, Sylvia San Jose, looked at this in, um, in, in the interlymph study. Uh, the 2014 paper here didn't update any numbers, so it's really based on, on the prior results. And what they're finding is an increased risk of CLL for those individuals who have been infected by the hepatitis, v, uh, hepatitis C virus. And the underlying hypothesis, this one, is maybe possibly chronic antigen stimulation or possibly uh, a disruption of the T cell function. But more studies uh, are needed to, uh, to understand the biology behind this. The problem with hepatitis C virus is its variability of its incidence across studies, and so it's a complicated exposure to measure. Height is another one that's been consistently shown to be associated with risk of CLL. Um, so this is a replication of, of other studies that have been done, uh, and so we had our inner lymph study, and so for looking at uh, the risk of CLL, we do see as increased risk of, uh, of uh, CLL with a, a greater a height stature. And the concept behind height, the biology, is that you could possibly with um, in, uh, taller individuals have increased exposure to growth hormones uh, that possibly stimulate B cell proliferation, such as the insulin-like growth factor one. Another hypothesis uh, showing, uh, supporting this height uh, association would be increased infections actually have been shown to be associated with a shorter stature. And if you have increased infections, then you have a stronger immune system. Having a stronger immune system perhaps uh, protects you against NHL. 
and CLL in particular. So next, we looked at a whole slew of occupations, but farming is the one that, that is consistently showing up. And so we're, we're validating what prior studies have found. Uh, so here what we're showing is the interlymph uh, study. So again, we have, have you ever lived or worked on a farm? Has about a 20% increase in risk of getting CLL. And you can see some of the variability across uh, what we ask uh, uh, participants. So, uh, so we broke every lived on a farm, every worked on a farm. Are you an animal farmer or a crop farmer? And so it does vary. If you're an animal farmer, there's a, actually a protective uh, association, but our sample sizes are small. And so you remember, we have 2,400 CLL cases in the study, but we only have 29 individuals across these international studies that are reporting that they have animal farmers. Um, and so it's quite a difficult exposure to measure, but what's comforting, if you will, is um, across a number of studies over time has still shown that there's association between farming exposures and uh, risk of CLL. You dive deeper into the pesticides, for example, it, um, they still find the associations, but they're still complicated to measure due to the small sample size uh, uh, with this exposure. So last but not least, family history. Uh, family history is a strong risk factor for CLL. My colleague, Lynn Golden, has done a, a, a wonderful study looking at this, where they looked at the Swedish cancer registry, and, and Sweden has this national um, family registry where they know who's related to whom. And so they linked up these two registries and able to conduct a well-designed, well unbiased study to look at, at the relationship of family history and risk of CLL. And what they found is that you, if you have a first-degree relative of CLL, you have an eight and a half fold increased risk of CLL. It's one of the strongest risk factors for CLL. They also identified other lymphoproliferative disorders that are associated with uh, uh, first degree relatives. So you have a, a, almost a two fold increased risk of non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Uh, uh, if you dive in a little bit deeper to the subtypes, you have a four fold increase of Waldenstrom's, 3.3 for hairy cell, and a 1.6 fold increase for follicular lymphoma. Okay, so I know this is very difficult to read, but I just wanted to point out that there's a, a, a paper in 2016, uh, this year, that was looking at the familial risk across cancers. And this is a twin study that was conducted. Uh, and, and you can see here's a whole bunch of different cancers. Leukemia is down at the bottom. And this, again, is leukemia. All leukemia is not just CLL. And they're showing a, a, 15, uh, a relative risk of 15 for family history. So it's, a, it's still supporting that the family history is a strong risk factor for CLL. And you can see how it compares to other cancers. They also show that what the, so you have this family history uh, as a risk factor for CLL. So this could be due to a shared environment. So all these individuals are living together. What's, what's, uh, what about their environment that may increase their risk? Or it could be due to their inher inherited variants. Uh, and so what this uh, result is showing then, that it's mostly due to the genetics and not the shared environment um, uh, for that familial relationship or, or association. And so here they have a, a heritability estimate of, of, of about 57. And so it's one of the higher ones across the other cancers. So here's a pedigree with my uh, colleague, Neil Kayu, and I, uh, who's ascertained at Mayo Clinic. And so you can see a whole bunch of individuals have CLL on this pedigree. This is something that's uh, more than what you'd expect by chance. What's driving this familial relationship? Well, this is the genetic component that I'm talking about. So what, are, what is the inherited genetic factors? And so for those of you who are not familiar with the genetic studies, one of the common approaches is a genome-wide association study. And what this approach does is that you, it's an agnostic approach where you look across the genome to see which, which regions of the genome are associated with your trait of interest, in this case, CLL. And you have typically genotype a large number of markers, anywhere between half a million to five, uh, five million markers. And you look at each one individually with the risk of CLL. You typically have unrelated cases and controls in this study design, but the study designs required to get published in any high-quality journal is you have, they have a very stringent uh, threshold of significance because you're, you're testing a whole bunch of variants across the whole genome, therefore you have to reduce your false positives. The second thing about this study design is that they also require validation and independent samples. And so between those two components, you actually have strong, robust findings that are holding up over time. <clears throat> 
And so for CLL, there's a number of studies that have been published. My colleague Richard Holston was the first one to publish it in 2008. And then subsequently, there's been a number of that have been published since then. And through all these studies, it's, it's really the increase in sample size. That's what's the difference. So we keep genotyping more CLL cases and more controls, we find more genetic variants. And so um, currently, so my colleague and I, Richard, uh, and I have a paper under review uh, where we have the largest CLL GWAS that I've, uh, that's been done to date, um, where we have uh, 4,400 CLL cases and 13,000 controls. And we identified nine more inherited variants that are associated with CLL risk. Uh, uh, that, so we have a total of over 40 variants identified to date. And you can see here, here's the, the chromosomal regions. Uh, this is just the strength of the, the, the minus log 10 of the p-value, showing the significance, and, the, and it's distributed across the whole genome. So if you look at the relationship among these genetic variants, so these genetic variants that we identified are in genes or near genes, and if you look at those genes uh, and, and kind of run a pathway analysis, you actually see some relationship among those inherited those genes. And so the genes are actually falling in the APOP, whoops, apoptosis pathway and the telomere length pathway, as well as the B-cell lymphocyte development pathway. So these are biologically plausible mechanisms for risk of CLL for these inherited variants. You have to remember that these variants that we're identifying are not causal. They're just identifying a region in the genome that's associated with CLL risk. All the labs, uh, now it's the hard work to figure out what's going on uh, driving that relationship. Uh, so it could be a, there's a variant in there, a non-synonymous variant that affects the, uh, the protein structure, um, or it could be a variant that's in a regulatory region that turns on and off genes downstream on another chromosome. And so it, now we have to dig deeper in these regions to really understand what's, what's going on. So if you take all these variants together and add them up, so I have an individual, and you look at all 40 or so plus variants, add up the number of risk variants that they have, you can create a polygenic risk score. And so here's what I've done for the CL cases versus controls. And you can see this distribution of, of the number of risk variants that an individual has. It's shifted to the right for the, uh, the CLL cases compared to the controls. If you compare the upper tail, you actually find a 2.7-fold increased risk of getting cell compared to those that are in the, in the middle of the distribution. So now these genetic variants are uh, compared to the non-genetic non variants. This is becoming one of the stronger risk factors for CLL. So heritability, uh, so you remember I mentioned that JAMA paper that came out, in two, in, came out this year was showing the heritability of CLLs around 58. Uh, so these genetic variants explain, that we've identified explain only 17 percent of the overall heritability that we observe, suggesting that more inherited variants can be, can be and will be identified that explain uh, this uh, heritability of CLO. So you remember earlier in the talk I had mentioned that there's this uh, variability in incidence of CLL between Caucasians and Asians, where the Asians have a very low incidence rate and, and the Caucasians have a very high incidence rate. We don't really know what's going on, but one of the hypotheses is that it's because of your underlying inherited genetic variants. And so there's uh, a, a few studies that have been done looking at uh, these genetic variants and other ethnicities. And so my colleagues have, whoops, I keep doing that. So my colleagues uh, have looked at 71 CLL cases and 1,200 uh, uh, controls from the, uh, Chinese descent. Uh, and so they looked at six of the genetic variants that have been identified in Caucasians. How do they do in the uh, Chinese uh, cases and controls? Three of those six are associated, they found evidence of association with uh, CLL risk in, in the Chinese uh, cases and controls. And now we also looked at African Americans. Again, the African American incidence rate is in between Caucasians and, and Asians. And so we looked at the African American in incidence rate uh, or association with, in 110 African American cases, and we compared it to public controls. And we only looked at 15 of the variants that have been identified in the Caucasians, um, and none of those were actually found to be associated with risk in CLL in African Americans. So why is that? So here's just looking at four of the inherited variants uh, found in Caucasians. These are common variants in Caucasians uh, with more than 20 percent frequency. However, if you look at the, the Chinese uh, allele frequencies for the, just these four particular variants, they're quite rare for three out of the four of them. And then African-American, they're also uncommon with uh, frequencies less than 10 percent. So 
what's driving this is that we're thinking that there's going to be different genetic variants that are actually associated or causing CLL in different ethnicities. However, to, to conduct these kind of studies in Asians and African Americans will take a large uh, sample size. They're very rare, so it will take an international consortium to bring enough uh, CLL cases together for these various eth ethnicities. So why is it important to understand what these factors uh, for clinical practice? So here's another pedigree that my colleague Neil Kay and I have uh, ascertained so, uh, from, at Mayo. So we have two siblings here with CLL in this family. They also have a sister with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and a prior Hodgkin's lymphoma. There's another Hodgkin's lymphoma sibling and a grandmother had Hodgkin's lymphoma. So why is it important to understand these factors? It's really these individuals. We have two individuals who, who have no evidence of any cancer or pre-clinical uh, cancer, but there's one individual who has been screened for monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, so that's the pre-cancer uh, uh, pre to CLL. So it's really important to these individuals, because I know my colleagues keep telling me, well, I have the CLL patient, and now they're wondering about their offspring and, and their siblings, uh, well, what's their risk of getting CLL? So monoclonal B-cell lymphocytosis, again, I said it's a precursor to CLL, and essentially what it is is, is just uh, um, individuals who have the, the, the uh, clonal population with a uh, CLL-like immunophenotype, but the expansion is just not as high as what you see with CLL of uh, 5 times 10 to the 9 liters. And they also have no evidence of other lymphomas or infections or autoimmune conditions. The prevalence of MBL is detected in about 5% uh, of, of individuals in the population who are 40 years or older. However, we've identified that the prevalence in CLL families is, is much higher at 15 to 18%. Um, the risk of progression from MBL to CLL is about 1% per year, but these are in individuals who have lymphocytosis. So they come to your clinic, they have an elevated uh, blood cell count, and then you flow, you, you screen them for MBL, and then these clinical, in, these individuals in your clinic who have um, uh, more than 500 cells per microliter, they're the ones who progress to CLL at about 1% per year. But my individuals in my families, these are the MBLs in my families, they have low count MBL, they don't have the elevated blood counts, they have the clonal cells, but they just don't have the expansion. The progression of these individuals to CLL is still yet to be determined. So it's still premature to bring genetic testing into the clinical practice. None of the inherited variants are uh, predisposition genes such as BRCA1. Uh, there's no known relationship between inherited variants and treatment response, but this is a very difficult study to conduct because treatment keeps changing, and uh, finding responders versus non-responders, you, you saw the earlier slides, there's not that many people out there to do uh, germline genetic variants and look at responders versus non-responders. I mean, we're starting to look at the somatic mutations, but the inherited variants, you still need a larger sample size. And so this is still no evidence of it to date, but I don't think it's been aggressively evaluated. So however, what I think the future direction is, is we bring everything together. We bring the non-environmental factors together. We bring the, the inherited variance factors together. We bring MBL screening together. And together, in one risk prediction model, uh, I hope to identify, uh, uh, to create a risk prediction model so that we can identify those who are at greater risk of getting CLL. This will be especially important for your, the relatives of your patients. So in summary, both genetic and non-genetic factors are associated with CLL risk. In particular, you've got the demographic variables, age, sex, uh, and, and ethnicity, which we still don't understand the bio underlying biological mechanism. We have sun exposure and atopy that play a protective role, and then we have farming exposures, hepatitis C, and height that seem to increase your risk of getting CLL. Uh, to date, the genetics, uh, there's over 40 inherited variants that have been identified to date. Uh, they, they, together, if you put them together, they make one of the strongest risk factors for CLL. We know that the more will be identified when we increase our sample size, um, but at this time, we don't recommend any genetic screening in clinical practice. So thank you.